Would you have s with Big Ed for ten thousand uh, dollars? Oh my god. Saw Konichiwa Genki Desuka or whatever. I recently went on a trip to Japan in order to go to this otter cafe and also interview a Japanese actress and ask her if she would sleep with Big Ed for ten thousand dollars. I love Asian women. But the question is, do Asian women love little Edward? Me. Mm. Socks, I've traveled all around the world, but I've never had a cleaner butt than in Japan because all the public restrooms have the days. I'm gonna talk more about our year wet vacation in Tokyo at the end of this video, so make sure you stay until the end of the video. Right now, let's talk about Debbie and Osama's relationship. So you will bring me to the US because for me as a bunch of, as a boy, there is no future for me here. All about your future? You should be ashamed of yourself the way you treated me okay. and lied to me. Uh, okay. You're scum of the earth. This is a story of about how Debbie never got flipped upside down. Let's talk about that, y'all. They've been dating for three years, right? And they've been so in love. We didn't even see this couple get intimate on the show one time. My family's Italian, so we're very expressive. The bare minimum you do for your grandma is kiss her on the cheek, right? Osama didn't even kiss his grandma on the cheek. Their entire season on Nine Day Fiance, they constantly said age is just a number and their love transcends age. For Osama, it's like, dog, you ever seen that video of Jim Carrey eat a watermelon? <laughs> On a serious note, it feels like we got trolled as an audience, but the good news is we finally got to hear what D1 poetry sounds like. Your words are deeply like the Bible. Touch me, hold my bones. Mm. You suck. Oh wow, this kid's poetry is straight fire, right? Debbie and Osama have been dating for about three years, which if the math is mathing, that means he started dating her when he was 21. To my knowledge, Debbie still has her real teeth, so we can rule the gum job fetish out of the equation. But if you're an elderly woman living in the United States, you should probably question the motives of a 21 year old Moroccan man and ask yourself, why would he want to enter a relationship with me? That's a real head scratcher, isn't it? Why would a 24 year old Moroccan man enter a relationship with a 67 year old woman from America. So you said that you want to move to the United States because in the United States, art is valuable and in Morocco, you claim art isn't valuable. However, you have made no attempt to sell your artwork in Morocco. And after seeing your skills, I don't know what kind of price they would fetch for in the United States, to be honest with you. A lot of your paintings look like you attempted to draw Squidward, but you didn't do a good job of drawing Squidward. To make matters even more troll, Osama said to the audience that he doesn't want to work and get a job because hard work kills the creation. I don't know one person that's successful in any career that hasn't worked hard to get to where they want to be. Osama doesn't even make an effort to sell his artwork in Morocco, so what makes him think he's going to make an effort to sell it in America? Also, I hate to break it to you, kid, but there's literal kids that go to art school that draw better than you do. After evaluating Osama's artwork and poetry, I've come to the conclusion that he's very lazy because I can't imagine any of us dedicating as much time to those crafts as he has and still being that dog water at those crafts. He seems like he doesn't want to work hard to obtain the things he wants out of life. His lack of drive, fanatical effort, and ambition makes him incredibly unlikable for the majority of the audience that watches the show because the rest of us are busting our butt to make sure that we can provide a good life for ourselves and our family. Osama claims to have been an artist and a poet his entire life, and he chooses to present this to the audience of one of the most watched shows in the United States. Touch me, hold my bones. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, where we left off telling this story, Debbie had just broken up with Osama because she found out that he was using her to come to America. Dun, dun, dun. I'm going back to the house. I'm packing my suitcases. I'm getting a hotel. And we're parting ways. Osama put all his skill points in deception and after years of love bombing a woman in her 60s, he foiled his own plan by getting irritated because he claims that Debbie talked too much when she was just trying to figure out what the plan was for them moving forward and progressing in their relationship because he never gave her a clear timeline for when things are happening. Remember, they're an engaged couple. However, he kept going back on his word and the timeline for when they were gonna get married. She was under the impression that she was moving there and they were gonna get married in Morocco and live their life in Morocco. And when she asked questions so that she could understand what the reality of the situation is, he got irritated at her for not being quiet while he paints the sunset when they're on a date where they're supposed to be talking and painting the sunset together. I'm always young in my paintings. Can you make it quiet so I can think? And Osama, okay, I'll shut up, okay. Shut up, I'm trying to do an Osama impression, but I can't look one way and then look at you too. Can you be quiet? I'm trying to paint. Why can't she talk to you when you're painting? 
I know that you're bad at multitasking, which is probably why you haven't got intimate with this woman yet. But here's the thing, throughout your entire segment, it seems like you've been getting really irritated at her for things that you wouldn't be irritated at if you actually love somebody. The audience members of the show could tell from the get-go that Osama was just telling Debbie what he assumed she wanted to hear. But if you don't actually love someone, don't tell them that you love them. It's very manipulative. The only thing Debbie and Osama had in common was their passion for painting and poetry. A little tip for Debbie, having hobbies in common with a 21 year old kid in Morocco is not a good reason to enter a relationship with that person, especially at your age. Let's be real about it, y'all. If Debbie was a man and Osama was a woman, good God, would the comments be different. I've seen a lot of arguments from members of the community that Debbie's pursuit of this relationship with Osama is predatory behavior, which makes it more ironic that at the tell-all, Debbie accused Jamie of being a predator. Chris is the giver, Jamie is the taker, and it's very easy for a predator to take advantage of Chris. Yo, when this happened, so many fans of the show lost respect for Debbie because that is a baseless accusation to throw at Jamie when Chris has had a false narrative in terms of finances throughout their entire relationship. At the early stages of their relationship, Chris convinced Jamie that she would financially support her and even go into business with her when she arrived in Colombia. Later, Chris went back on her word after convincing Jamie to quit her job and then stuck Jamie with the rent payments for the place they got together in Bogota, Colombia. And anytime Jamie asked to receive the rent payments that Chris originally promised to pay, Chris would scream at Jamie, call her names, and act irrationally. Chris even put her hands on Jamie, yet not one cast member stuck up for Jamie at the tell-all because on this show, there's a clear bias towards the American cast members. Debbie having the wrong take on Chris and Jamie's relationship didn't surprise me because the way the tell-alls are set up on this show are flawed. The American cast members arrive a couple days early to New York City. They all hang out and get to spend time with each other, but really tell each other their side of the story, their side of what went wrong in their respective relationships. The problem with this is you become incredibly jaded because the majority of the cast members on the show are creatures that don't have any friends. So they have this sense of camaraderie with the other cast members. And then when it's time for the tell all, they just unload on the foreign cast members because they think they got the real scoop and they don't. I have no doubt in my mind that Chris told the cast members a lot of lies before the tell all was filmed because she wanted a lot of the cast members to be on her side. I think that she took advantage of the fact that I, I worked hard and she knew that she could ask for something and I'd give it to her. This is so funny, but have y'all noticed that it's always the cast members that don't have two nickels to rub together that insinuate that whoever their partner is, is using them for money when they originally attracted them with money. The whole time I was watching Chris and Jamie's relationship, it reminded me of Mike and Jimena's relationship because Mike and Chris both used money to attract these girls only to hold it over their head and turn that into financial domination and not support. The problem with Chris is that she made so many empty promises to this girl throughout the entire season that there's no one that realistically sat down, watched their segment, and would be on Chris's side. The entire audience knows that she's lying. So throughout the entire tell-all, when everybody was backing Chris and no one was backing Jamie, it was just like a what the f moment. You're the one that wasn't working while I'm in America. I'm working day and night, taking every job I can to pay for the bills there. The savior complex is strong with this one, doing the most to portray the girl you supposedly love as a gold digger. When it came to Chris, Danielle, all the girls that sucked, they weren't held accountable because they were the American cast members, especially by the host. Anytime it's a situation where we as the audience want the host to go in deeper, she says, well, it looks like it won't be resolved today. Why don't we move on? And she talks like a weather boy. Wouldn't you like to know weather boy? You know why Love is Blind is better than 90 Day these days? Because they have the Lachey's and the Lachey's actually go in on people. Fun fact, Chris also happens to be mother of the year. Let's read this article together as a family. 90 Day Fiance star Chris Foster responds to claim she's a drug addict. Always worked really hard. You're right, Chris, drug dealers do work hard. Let's read the rest of the article. 90 Day Fiance D-lister Chris Foster responded to accusations from viewers who claim she has a drug addiction. In the comments section on her Saturday, May 20th Instagram post, a viewer asked the TLC alum 40 directly, there's a bunch of people over in Jamie's post talking about how you being an addict, any response to that? 
Chris responds with the question, how many addicts have two homes, a car, a motorcycle, three jobs, kids with cars, one with a college degree? Chris clapped back a day later on Sunday, May 21st. I've always worked really hard to help my kids have a better life and opportunities I didn't have. Spending the money I made from this show to start a charity, to travel the country, helping families in need, she continued. I don't have to defend myself, I know me. During the spinoff, fans watched Chris travel to meet her fiance, Jamie Noguera, for the first time in Colombia. Shortly into their trip, the Alabama native revealed a long list of medical issues including narcolepsy and an expensive possible neck surgery in the future where Chris would need to spend a year in bed. Oh, bet your neck hurt so bad that you jumped in the pool on your neck. Chris explained to her new wife that she had to return to the United States for two weeks to get a medication that was not available in Colombia. Hear me out though, that seems like something you would Google before you plan to move to Colombia. However, fans weren't convinced and accused the 90 Day Fiance the Other Way star of having a drug problem. I'm not gonna say that Chris doesn't have narcolepsy, maybe she does, but I'd bet that she has one hell of a drug addiction to go with it. One user tweeted at this time, meanwhile another wrote, Chris, you aren't sick, you are going through drug withdrawals. Chris's trip was later unexpectedly extended after her son, Dane Warren, was arrested on April 28, 2022, and charged with one felony count of trafficking fentanyl and one felony count of possession of a controlled substance. I never wanted that apartment. We looked at several apartments that were affordable and bigger, but something always happened with her, and that wouldn't work. So she got this apartment, and, and the same thing with her saying that oh my gosh, she didn't know see? about my physical, uh, my health issues. It's so jokes that this past season, Chris gave Jamie so much shit for selecting an apartment that was $150 more monthly than what she wanted to pay in Colombia, but it had everything that she wanted in an apartment. Yet Chris paid a whopping $51,000 to bail out her drug dealing son after only two days of him being detained. Hey mom, quick question. How's your punk kid supposed to learn his lesson in only two days? If my dad found out that I was selling drugs laced with fentanyl, he would leave me in prison and rightfully so because growing up in Vegas, we have a lot of friends that have died from that. Imagine that the deadliest drug crisis in U.S. history and you're adding to the problem, Chris. Debbie, you really want to stick up for Chris? You sure about that? What's that old saying, you guys, where there's smoke, there's usually a fire? I'm not surprised when I see a lot of fans speculate that Chris has a drug problem. Not to mention, Chris is also a confirmed pathological liar that has been caught lying multiple times throughout her season and especially on the tell-all. I think that she took advantage of the fact that I, I worked hard and she knew that she could ask for something and I'd give it to her. I was doing stuff for our future and trying to provide. Acá tengo la única transferencia que yo recibí de Chris Force. Jamie actually showed evidence that she didn't receive the rent payments from Chris, and Chris said that she sent the money to her mother to then send to Jamie, but she didn't send it. So instead of taking personal accountability for not giving the money you originally promised, you instead throw your own mother in front of the bus. And they're so biased on the show that they brought out Chris's mother, but no one from Jamie's family. Interesting. A little trick I picked up over the years is that if you feel like someone's lying to you, stare at them and don't say anything. If they're telling the truth, they're probably gonna say something like, what, it's true. However, if they're lying, they're gonna keep adding to the story until it makes sense in their brain, or at least they think that everyone else believes them, which is what Chris did the entire tell-all. Her story kept evolving. She kept adding to the story. Well, actually, I sent it to my mom, but why would you send it to your mom if that's your wife? You would just directly send the money to your wife. You're full of shit. If I'm lying, I'm dying. When I watched the tell-all live, I was screaming at my TV. Part of me almost wishes that I live streamed it because I was so unhinged. There's a lot more I could say about Jamie and Chris's relationship, but namaste or whatever. Let's talk about Osama and Debbie now. From the beginning of this past season, Debbie made it crystal clear to the audience that the overall plan with her and Osama's relationship was to get married in Morocco and spend the rest of their days in Morocco. Osama said, Debbie, come to Morocco and be my wife. But the sad news for poor Debbie was that Osama had a different plan altogether. Our plan is you will come here and bring me to the USA and I will go to work there and we start our life there. When Osama gave Debbie the ultimatum that she either brings him to the United States or their relationship is over, she was devastated. So what did Debbie do? I'm happy you asked. She broke up with Osama, went back to her hotel and then called up her son Julian to complain. I just hate having to call you and tell you bad news. Me and Osama 
are not together right now. There's not one person that's more thrilled about the relationship being over between Debbie and Osama than her son, Julian. He told his mother from the get-go, this man in Morocco is obviously scamming you because why would a 21-year-old kid from Morocco enter a relationship with a 64-year-old woman from America? Debbie goes on to tell her son, Julian, that gosh darn it, it's like at night Osama turns into a different person. But instead of feasting on blood like a vampire, he instead feasts on older women's mental health. <laughs> This was a man I loved, and now he's turned into somebody else. I've seen a lot of fans of the show speculate that Osama and his sister were both messaging Debbie together, which made sense for a number of reasons. One of which is the way he messaged her on text is different than how he spoke to her when she arrived in Morocco. Another reason that fans speculate this is because his sister wanted to come to America so bad and looked like she was devastated when she heard the news from Debbie that they were planning on staying in Morocco. It's also a slippery slope because the sister even said to the audience that it's always been her and her brother's dream to come to the United States. You know, I didn't see ever see it happening like this, I was looking for my happily ever after. Throughout this conversation that Julian's having with his mom, he's convincing her that coming home to the United States and cutting all ties with this guy is the most logical decision to make. However, Debbie has so much time invested in this relationship that she's unfortunately willing to give Osama a second chance, so she meets up with him at a cafe. Debbie shows up at the cafe where she's supposed to meet Osama at and tries to order some alcoholic beverages because she's had a hell of a time with this dude in Morocco. Do you have any Texas margarita? We have a tea and we have a coffee. Coffee and tea only, no absinthe. No. <laughs> so jokes, Debbie's trying to see the green fairy and I get it because this guy used her. That's a really uncomfortable feeling to sit with. But at the same time, Debbie, this is a cafe, not a bar. And the majority of us don't know what a Texas margarita is. Let's look it up though. Okay, I just looked it up. The only difference between a margarita and a Texas margarita is the Texas margarita has orange juice in it. So the more you know, I guess we're the new learning channel. Osama pulls up to the cafe and explains to the audience that he's really excited to talk to Debbie because he doesn't want the last conversation they have to be the fight they had on his family farm. Osama then tries to convince the audience that he doesn't just love Debbie for what she can give him. For example, a visa to America, even though it sounded like that was the case when they were talking at the farm. Please, you will come here and bring me to the USA. This is our plan. I'm our way from this day. Never change it. Osama's like, come on, do I look like that kind of guy that would use an old woman for a green card? <laughs> No, I love Debbie because of poetry, because of painting, all the things we have in common. She's smart. She understands me. He's a really smooth talker, and he seems like he knows what to say to get someone to drop down their guard. And he just seems like one of those guys that tells you everything he assumes you want to hear. The problem is that his words do not match his actions at all. And we as the audience can really see that by how the minute this guy didn't get what he wanted, he was so comfortable throwing the entire relationship away. When it's like, eyes up here, kid, if you actually love someone, it wouldn't be that easy to throw the entire relationship away. You made me feel despised. I told you this before, that when I am angry, you don't have to care about what I'm saying. Bruh, providing an excuse like, don't worry about what I say in the heat of the moment is so immature, given the fact that hurtful words destroy relationships. When you say something really messed up to your partner, you can't take it back. And in the words of Jonah Hill from that movie, Super Bad, people don't forget. When I am angry, I don't even focus or think of what I'm saying. Oh, Beto, Sama, quick question for you. What steps are you taking to communicate with your partner in a healthier way when you feel disrespected? <sighs> Because right now it just seems like you want your partner to excuse your toxic behavior and be your verbal punching bag, which is unrealistic. Here's a wacky idea, Osama. Instead of verbally attacking your partner's character, how about you use an I statement and express a positive need? For example, that iconic argument that this couple had on the family farm when they were painting the sunset could have been resolved if Osama communicated like this. My baby, I love you so much. I am a homebody. I am not used to someone always being in my world. I love you, but when I have a desire for silence, can you please respect my desire for silence while I paint? I use this time to think. I understand that you want a detailed timeline for when things are happening. Would you be willing to talk about the timeline after we finish our paintings of the sunset? Thank you, Osama, and it makes me feel, feel very special. It's actually that easy, G. You can take that formula and apply it to any conversation you're having with your girl. 90% of the time, you're gonna prevent a fight because majority of women just wanna feel hurt. Debbie goes on to explain to Osama that sometimes he's like a ticking time bomb and she never knows when he's gonna blow up on her. 
be honest, I chuckled when she called him a ticking time bomb because his name's Osama. <laughs> Osama replies with, That's life. I can't promise I'm not going to get angry again. You get angry sometimes too. Buddy boy, the cure for defensiveness is taking responsibility. We all get angry, but how we act on our anger is our responsibility. Your entire season, we've seen you struggle with accepting your partner's perspective and apologizing. What was our plan? Yeah. Is you will come here and make our documents and after go to the US to live there. Instead of make documents, we were supposed to come here to get married, but you're oh, talking geez. documents oh. and papers. Clearly for Debbie, this was a relationship, but for Osama, it was a transaction. It makes me laugh because I've never seen a guy shoot his shot with a grandma for three years in order to come to the United States to be a struggling artist in the United States. You're making everything about a visa. I'm making everything about a life. Your mind is like, yeah. like this. Yeah. You can't see like this. It's not that he can't see your perspective, it's that he chooses to ignore your perspective because your perspective doesn't serve him. It's a tough pill to swallow for Debbie because clearly what Osama desires is to come to the United States. She is interchangeable with any other older woman that would bring him to the United States. The reason why he stayed so long in this relationship with her is because he had so much time invested and he thought after time he could break down those barriers and overstep or convince her to bring him to the United States wasn't the case. And you can tell that by how when Debbie arrived to Morocco, the first conversation they had was about her doing his laundry for him, cooking for him. It was all about what she could do to be a good wife to him. Nothing about him being a good husband to her. You don't have enough strong love for me to accomplish a life here. So you never had unconditional love for me. And I'm glad to know that now. You never believe in my love. Dude's just nodding his head, admitting that his love is conditional. <laughs> Why don't you believe in my love, Debbie? Was it that time I almost killed you when you were riding my donkey? <laughs> or was it that time I told my family you were bringing me to the United States so they would approve of our relationship? <laughs> Osama goes on to say, these are your opinions, not mine. Dude looks like a young Jafar while saying this. At this moment in typical narcissist fashion, Osama is recognizing that his grip on Debbie is loosening. So he tells her that she's changed. No, and you can guarantee the future here. Abs is dying here, poetry is dying here. So how you want to live in Morocco? No, I'm saying here, you will lose your money. I've got money. My money is my business. I pay my bills, my bills are paid. Debbie, with peace and love, you gotta get your eyes checked out, girl. You let this thing break you up. Secondly, Osama, it's not your place to talk about what she does with her money. You're still living at home with your parents because you're a leech. If you look on Google, there are many accomplished painters from Morocco that have sold their pieces for well over $30,000. Osama, you've never painted anything noteworthy or of high value in your entire life, so it seems like a convenient excuse to try and blame your home country for why you're so bad at art. That would be like me not getting a lot of views on a video and being like, YouTube in Las Vegas is washed up. Ugh, I should move to another country because then my views will get better. It's like, no, dude, just make better videos or in your case, make better paintings. And I was willing to build the foundation but for, for me, us. I know my country. So you don't know squat, man. You don't know squat. Talk to the hand. <laughs> Debbie said, talk to the hand. I pay my bills. My bills is paid. Yeah, don't let this bum tell you what to do with your money, queen. Das and slay. Big snaps for Debbie. She takes her belongings, walks away from this Moroccan scammer, doesn't even bother to turn to look back at him. Meanwhile, Osama watches his visa walk away, and the next time we see him is on the tell-all. Oh, wow, it's time for the nine-day fiancé tell-all. Who wants cancer? <laughs> yeah, I tried, to, I tried to call Debbie, but she didn't answer. How many times did you try to call her? Like thousands of times. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, hey, anything to not work, right, Osama? Instead of getting a job to financially support you and your family, you're spending all day calling your ex. And a thousand times, bruh, if someone calls me more than five times, I immediately want to block them. Debbie says the reason that she didn't answer her ex's thousands of calls was that it was too difficult to process what went down in Morocco. She needed some time to think about it and heal, which is totally understandable. I can only imagine Osama's father's conversations that he has with his son on a daily basis. Son, why don't you get a job? You can paint and recite poetry when you aren't working. No, Papa. Poetry is my passion. I am poetry incarnate, but it is dead here in Morocco. The land of opportunity for poetry is the United States of America. 
want to play in the big leagues, you want to eat at the Cracker Barrel and pay this income tax, why don't you come over and find out how hard it is to build a life here, kid? Anyways, they play a couple clips of what went down this season, and after reliving all the trauma that this man has put her through, Debbie has this to say to Osama. You know, the old Osama I used to know wasn't a mean person, but now he's a very mean, unkind person. I'm a cotton-headed ninny muggins. <sighs> My question for Osama is, what is your version of what happened in your relationship? Well, we break up because DB told me that she will move to Morocco forever. But before, we never planned for this. I don't know if she's been smoking something or what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> this guy right here has to be some kind of dumb idiot. It's one thing to try and lie to the other broken toys, but how dare you try to lie to us? Debbie mentioned to you and the audience that the plan was to move to Morocco and start a life in Morocco, spend the rest of your days there, both before she came to Morocco and while she was there. And you got caught in a lie in front of the entire audience. We have the footage of that. Todos vemos a Osama como la oveja mala. La señora Debbie, con todo el respeto, déle su tarjeta verde y ayude al muchacho que vaya a su país a trabajar. Hey, we got Johan coming out of left field saying, somebody get this man a green card because Johan is also someone that wants a green card so that he can come work in the United States. The difference between Johan and Osama is Johan's actually desirable for the majority of girls because he's 6'7", he has good family values, he's a good looking guy, he works hard. His partner, Danielle, is terrible. I mean, if I don't apply for a visa, he can't go anywhere. So like, I could just hold on to his marriage certificate and never apply for a visa. I actually see where Johan's coming from because it is not fair that she wants to live in his country, but he's not allowed to live in her country. If anything, it seems like in the back of her head, Debbie already knew that Osama was using her for a green card, which is why she was so against bringing him to the United States. And if that's the case, why even entertain this relationship with him? If I asked her this question, I'm sure her answer would be, I loved him, we were in love. It takes more than love for a relationship to work. And you would think at age 67, you would know that. After watching Debbie Moore, especially on the tell-all, I can tell that she's not as ditzy as she's portraying herself to be. And this is something that a lot of blondes do, act dumb in order to get what they want. The host then questions Osama about whether he was truly in love with Debbie or not, and this is his response. Yeah, I loved her, but now I don't love her. Hmm, interesting answer. The host then asks Osama why he was trying to contact Debbie so much if he didn't love her. Just, I mean, to explain to her that, I mean, like we have to end this and uh, like there is no more future for us. Just to make things clear. Osama bin Lion, instead of calling your ex a thousand times to remind her y'all were broken up, you should have wrote a poem. That's what a real poet would have done. That's what Edgar Allan Poe did when he broke up with the Raven. Who makes phone calls to tell somebody it's over when they're not taking your calls? Uh, me, Osama, can do this. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Osama. Osama's such a troll that he's starting to grow on me. And you know what? I was really critical of Nicole's hair and then I got the same haircut. Bruh, tell me why we look like cupbearers in King Arthur's court. Cutscene of Debbie's son Julian in the back room getting heated because Osama keeps lying and he's anxious. Can't wait to get out there and defend his mama. Mahmoud points out the obvious, the age difference between Osama and Debbie is too thick for this to be legit. Then Rishi, the Indian dude adds, how can you love someone so much and then snap your fingers and fall out of love with them? That's comedy to hear that from Rishi. My question for Rishi is why would you enter a relationship with an older woman when you know for a fact that your parents wouldn't approve of her? I could argue that what you did to your fiance was more cowardly than what Osama did because he didn't use his parents as a scapegoat. The host then brings out Julian and strap in because Gabe's face says it all. We're here for the drama and the confrontation. Yo, Julian walks out, doesn't even make it to his seat before talking directly to Osama the scammer. Julian says, boy, let me tell you something. You should be ashamed of yourself. You are full of shit. You mess with somebody's mama. You don't do that. You're in my world now. I do declare my nipples are hard to do. I don't know about y'all, but I love that Julian is just as dramatic as his mom. A lot of people thought that this was cringe, but I thought it was really sweet that he was defending his mom. And yo, Jen got wet by watching this, legit. She actually told Julian she loved him twice, and she thought it was so hot because her man Rishi never defended her one time throughout their entire relationship. So to watch Julian defend his mom with so much passion and energy, she was like, oh, fuck. I love you. Wow. Yeah. I just so love you. Okay. He better not be calling no more. He better not be texting. 60 texts in what, two hours? 60 texts in two hours? That's a whole ass novel, bruv. That's so weird, especially when the other person isn't responding and you're just sending your messages out into the void. Did you send Debbie a text that said, I love you? 
I, don't, I can't remember. Julian claims that Osama's lying, which is believable because Osama has lied throughout this entire past season. I'm a cop. I can sniff out bull <laughs> miles away, and you're the biggest bull <laughs> I've ever seen in my entire life. You're lucky my mom even gave you a second of her life. Okay, dog. Yo, shots fired. When he's calling him a dog, he's not saying it like, what up, dog? He's calling him a bitch. But our man Julian fires back by talking about Osama's fucked up teeth. Go to the dentist and get yourself fixed up, man. <laughs> oh, Try to use people, come over here for green cards. Quit praying off of elderly women that look like they're, they're vulnerable. Get a job. No, I will not get a job because I'm a poet and I will die for my dream. Why is Osama talking about this? Like he's risking his life to recite poetry in Morocco. It's not illegal to be a poet there. I will die for my dream. You'll die for your dream, but you won't put in any work to make your dream a reality. Make it make sense. Debbie then revealed to the audience and the other broken toys that over their three year relationship, she sent Osama about $3,000, which was for day to day activities, groceries. She referred to this money as chump change, which given the American perspective, I understand, but that money goes a long way, especially in Morocco. Gabe's feeling empathetic, so he offers advice to Osama to sell his artwork to tourists so that he can make a good wage for himself. Something that we said earlier in the video, it's actually a good idea. Osama's response is one of those ones when you hear and you can't believe that someone actually said that out loud. I mean, I'm not selling underwears or something. I'm selling something valuable for me, selling to people who understand my art not someone who wants to buy so Atlantic. Trying, and Gabe was trying to help you, man, and you're gonna insult his product? Who are you to look down at Gabe, who is a business owner that made underpants with a prosthetic dick sewed into the underpants for women that are transitioning to become men so that they can feel more confident when they wear their clothes and go outside? Osama, you aren't in a financial position to be selective about who purchases your artwork. You're actually starving, dog. You're limiting it does, yourself. It, does, it doesn't make sense for you, because you are not an artist and you can understand this kind of things. Yikes, this dude's closed mindedness is so tilting, especially because Gabe was trying to show up for him and offer advice. And it's like, if you're a starving artist in Morocco, that's a lazy bum that's never done anything noteworthy in his life. And you have someone more successful than you that has created a product, brought it to market and sells and improves people's lives. Why wouldn't you listen to that person, be a sponge and absorb as much knowledge as you can? Besides, there are so many artists that leave their pieces up to the public interpretation, his fundamental understanding of art is wrong. Which, to be honest, makes the situation even funnier because he's dedicated so much of his life to art. The conversation then shifts to whether Osama was physically attracted to Debbie or not. Remember, she's 67 years old, he's 24 years old. So a lot of fans assume that he wasn't physically attracted to her at any point throughout their entire relationship. Not to mention, as I said earlier in the video, they never kissed one time on the show, so the entire relationship feels troll. Yeah, uh, Debbie, why don't tell them about the night in the Casablanca. Hey, when Osama brings up the night in Casablanca, my mind goes to the worst place. <laughs> DB, why you don't tell them about the night in the Casablanca? Debbie looks a little shooketh, so it makes me genuinely curious whether they piped or not. We had some wonderful evenings together, enjoyed wine and cheese and fine food. And yes, he tried to get amorous with me. Wait, tried to get amorous? Debbie did not go into great detail about her sex life with Osama and Barry White time because she's a classy lady and I respect that. Now I will say something I find sus is that Debbie admits that whenever Osama tried to make physical advancements towards her, she turned it down. And I'm curious why if you love someone, you're planning to spend the rest of your life with them, the physical aspect of the relationship is very important. So I'm curious why she turned down all of his physical advancements if she did in fact love him. <laughs> but that's normal, you know? Hey, Barry White time. Yes. He wanted to try to get Barry White time with you, right? Yeah. <laughs> he tried to get some Barry White time. I think we all like Debbie, but the facts are that she gained more from this relationship with Osama than Osama gained from her. So I would love to know your thoughts about the entire situation in the comments below. Debbie goes on to say that Osama would have to move a mountain for her to even respond to him. You know, he could start by sending me an airline ticket. No, oh, see, no, see, that, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think Debbie's trolling here because she knows that Osama can't even afford an airplane ticket. He doesn't have a job. The host then asks Osama if he's willing to move a mountain to get Debbie back in his life. No, I don't think so. 
Yeah, we'll see text messages in about three days. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Think so. <laughs> okay. It is official, ladies and gentlemen. Debbie and Osama are broken up for good. At this time, the cast takes a break, and Debbie takes it upon herself to try and play matchmaker. We got a little Cupid in the making because she saw the way that Jen was looking at her son, so she asked Julian what he thinks about Jen. Didn't you think Jen was kind of cute and nice? Do you think she kind of was, like, batting her eyes at you a little bit? I think... She's a cool person. Uh, I think she did a lot more than that, Debbie. She looked like she was ready to give your son the gorilla grip two-hand twist. My question for Debbie is whose side are you on? Because obviously Julian can do better than Jen. You want your son to sleep with Rishi's sloppy seconds, really? Why you put me on a spot like that, Mom? I, I'm, not... I'm not putting you on no spot. I'm just saying that, hey, you know, her dude is kind of like... He's kind of acts like Osama a little bit. I don't think Julian likes Jen as anything other than a friend, but let me know in the comments if you think that they would make a cute couple. Well, Socks, it's about that time. Now that we finished talking about Debbie and Osama, let's talk about our Japan trip that we went on together as a family. I documented the entire trip, so I can't wait to tell you guys what we did. Before I talk about it, I would just like to say, regardless of whether you're a Democrat or Republican, I don't care. I want to start a political party where we make it our life's mission to make sure that every public restroom in America has a bidet. My ass has never been cleaner than in Japan. I felt great. I think we would all make more educated decisions if we all had a clean ass. And your Tokyo is lovely this time of year. Funny enough, we're going. In one hour, we will fly to the land of sushi, anime, and Godzilla. My good friend Armand and I walked through the airport to our gate at LAX. After walking, walk, 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 we finally arrived at our gate and we soon discovered that there was a bar across our gate and we thought it was a really good idea to get drunk before our long flight to Japan. So that's what we did. We made a couple friends at the bar. We also had five shots of tequila before we boarded our flight and we were the last people to board. We actually almost missed our flight to Japan. On the flight, we ordered four whiskey ginger ales each. We fell asleep for about five hours and there was a period of time where we sat where the stewardesses sit and crush beers and talk for about two hours before getting kicked out and having to go back to our seats. The way I planned this trip was I wanted to not film the first two days so that we could get a feel for the vibe in Tokyo because we both have never been to any country in Asia before. When I awoke from my five hour cat nap, I quickly put in my AirPods because sitting behind me were about five weeaboo dudes talking about how they can't wait to find their waifu in Japan. And who do you think would win in a fight between Goku and St. Thomas? I read light novels, manga, I watch anime. If you make it your entire personality, you're cringe. Just like if you're vegan and the only thing you talk about is being vegan. To be fair, these weeaboos that just got let out of their mom's basement don't represent every single American tourist coming to Japan. However, I did see a lot of y'all that looked like you haven't showered in a week, you were stinky, you were wearing anime t-shirts. Y'all need to chill with that because here's the thing, you're a representation of our country right? I don't want them thinking that all American dudes are like you. Once we arrived to the Narita International Airport, the most cost efficient method to get to our hotel would have been taking the train. We didn't do that. We took a taxi to our hotel in Shibuya and it cost around $200. The taxi ride was worth because I wanted to feel like a big baller. And also I was tired from traveling all day. I didn't want to lug my heavy suitcase and try to figure out the train system at that time. Once we finally arrived to Shibuya, it was difficult to locate our hotel because there was an intense rainstorm. Armand and I don't really mind the rain because we live in Las Vegas and it's a desert here, so it rarely rains. After a while, we finally found our hotel, so we lugged our heavy suitcases to the hotel and checked in. Checking into the hotel. The world doesn't run on Dunkin', it runs on Wi-Fi, bro. Once we got to our room, we showered, changed, freshened up, and then went immediately out because we were starving. We were trying to find a sushi restaurant, but we ended up at an Italian restaurant on some troll behavior. I saw the happy hour menu, but it was all in Japanese, so I didn't know what it was. I assumed it was tapas, so I tried to order one of everything, but it was actually cocktails. I think you've had enough, Peter. Yeah, you don't know. You get away! I, I know my body better than you! So 8 p.m. on a Friday in Shibuya, we are all blasted. All of a sudden, these two salads men come and sit next to us. We start talking to them, shooting the shit. We buy them a round of drinks. They buy us a round of drinks. All of a sudden, we're hitting a compai, which is the cheers there. And it's funny because in Italy, our cheers is chin chin, which there means dick. We start screaming chin chin. They were supposed to come clubbing with us to this club called Harlem and they didn't end up making it because we got them too sauced up and one of them was asleep in the bushes, just fully sprawled. First night after bar hopping, we went to this club called Harlem and we danced and drank there for about seven hours straight and then we went home at around 6 a.m. At one point, we were drinking with everybody that worked at the club, which was really fun and it was cool to talk to them about what it's like growing up in Japan. When we walked back to our hotel at around 6 a.m., it was a monsoon outside, but it was 
such a vibe because we had the entire city to ourselves. So we took a lot of photos and videos. 2011, Japan, forget about it. A black and white anime right over here. Snack. Leave it. <laughs> the diversity. <laughs> hey, yo, our passports are wet. That's okay. We're dripping. Welcome back to Snack Guests in Japan. First, we have some almonds with dried fish. Delicious. First night in Tokyo. Clearly one for the books. 6 a.m. next to Hello Kitty. <laughs> the next morning after going loco clubbing all night, I went to Family Mart, which is a popular convenience store in Japan, which just so happens to have the best chicken nuggets I've ever had in my entire life. When it comes to the chicken nugget selection, you got a lot of options. You got spicy nuggets, you got extra salty nuggets. I pulled a Ron Swans and I said, give me all the chicken nuggets you got. Wow, you watch Demon Slayer and you've never heard of the chicken nugget demon. I guess you're not the Demon Slayer fan you thought you were. Family Mart is the place to be. They have an amazing cocktail selection, beer selection, chicken skewer selection. Where can we get chicken skewer? here you know what I mean I was thinking about the last time I had chicken skewers was when I was a kid at Disneyland by the Indiana Jones ride you could walk in a family mart hunt over his butt and I did this many days I was in Tokyo grab three chicken skewers a coffee and it comes out to five dollars the second day we went to Harry Harajuku Terrace to play with the otters I love animals way more than people so this has been on my bucket list for a long time because one of my favorite animals are otters come the 90 day the otter way you split fish with the other girl otters find out. How's my ass look? I was about to say, it's kind of juicy. Bad and juicy? It's fucking juicy, but you got a little stain on the back. Do I actually? <laughs> the cherry on top about the cafe was, in addition to otters, we got to play with chinchillas, hedgehogs, and a big rabbit named Toast. While I show y'all footage of us feeding and playing with the otters, I'm gonna tell you some fun facts about these furry little delights. Fun fact number one, sea otters can live their entire life in the ocean without leaving, just like merman. Next fun fact, to ensure that they don't drift apart, otters will hold hands when they're sleeping, which I think is so cute. These ones, on the other hand, hold hands for food, which is more relatable. I would do just about anything for food. Last fun fact about otters, because I have ADHD and we need to move on, is that the mama otters will carry the baby otters on their bellies, which is really cute. But speaking of cute, check out Toast. I love his vibe. Toast has to be the biggest rabbit I've ever seen in my life. And for about five minutes, I was trying to figure out what kind of dog he was. And then Armand said it's a Pomeranian. And I gave him the side eye because how dare you compare Toast to a Pomeranian? They're the most useless dog ever. This is Maui. He works at the Otter Cafe. He's great vibes. We became friends right away, especially because because his haircut reminds me of Shigo, but as a Japanese guy. Maui was nice enough to hand me a chinchilla and I've never seen one of these before. We also played with Sonic the Hedgehog and I fed him worms, but I have to say the highlight of the entire experience was feeding the otters fish. That made my whole life worth it, I think. Maui and I hit it off so much that later in the trip, he went to karaoke and went out clubbing with us. I made like 50 friends in Japan. People were so friendly there. After the otter cafe, we went to a Japanese festival and I was able to try some of the traditional street food and it was scrumdilyumptious. Later that night, we went to a ninja themed restaurant and it was a super dope experience. I ordered y'all a kid's meal so you could feel like you were included as well. The steak I got at the Ninja restaurant was the best steak I've ever had in my entire life and I've eaten a lot of steak. It's actually high key difficult to summarize the entire trip because so many things happen and I enjoyed the vibe so much that I was only supposed to stay for two weeks and I stayed for three weeks. Now I'm back to work getting on a good workout schedule, video schedule, and there's a new season of the show. So we have a lot to review to be fair. Real quick, I wanna talk about the interview I did with the Japanese actress when I asked her if she would sleep with Big Ed for $10,000. We also played Smash or Pass with the Creature Clips, I mean, cast members from the show. So that's gonna be really funny. I'm also translating that video into Japanese. Funny enough, this is the first in-person interview I've ever done in my entire life, let alone posted on the channel. So when that video comes out, if y'all could show it love, I would really appreciate it. The main reason why I wanted to do this interview was that it would be something different for y'all to watch on the channel other than just doing commentary. I wanna build up my interview EXP because a lot of people say that I should replace the host from TLC because she doesn't go in enough on the creatures. And also she treats the foreign cast members like absolute trash. Overall summary of Japan, what a vibe. The food alone is reason enough to visit there. Super thankful y'all watch my content. Comment below, subscribe. Love you, bro, love you, bro. Follow me on Twitch and on Instagram right now.